know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk is about Charles Leland C.L. Sonishin's authoring of the Billy the Kid imposter hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. The information is from my book, Cracking the Billy the Kid imposter hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. Charles Leland C.L. Sonishin is the surprise member of the trio who created the labor-intensive, destructive, and enduring hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts as Billy the Kid. His cohorts were delusional imposter Oliver Brushy Bill Roberts and sociopathic mastermind William V. Morrison. Its flip side was defaming Sheriff Pat Garrett as murdering an innocent victim instead of Billy the Kid and hiding his crime to collect the reward. Sonishin, an English teacher, folklorist, and quasi-fictional Old West writer, authored the Brushy Bill Hoax's 1955 book titled Alias Billy the Kid, listing Morrison as second author. He evaded blame by pretending neutrality. An example is his May 30th, 1989 letter to a Robert Dyer. He wrote, I presented Morrison's evidence, but I did not take sides. That was his scam. There weren't sides. There was just the hoax and the history. Sonishin peddled the hoax. He faked Brushy as having special knowledge, backed Morrison's lawyer imposture, lied about sources' contents, created conspiracy theories, and rallied later Brushy backing writers. Why did he do it? An avid joiner of Old West history clubs, Sonishin was a 48-year-old relative unknown when William V. Morrison introduced him to Brushy Bill Roberts doing his Billy the Kid act. Ambitious Sonishin apparently realized that into his life had walked two men offering him a contrarian niche in that famous history. But was he a hoaxer? The difficulty in analyzing Sonishin's role is separating incompetence from hoaxing. Was he a dupe or a deceiver? C.L. Sonishin had a great front for mimicking a scholar, a Harvard PhD, though in 17th and 18th century English language. He was no scholarly historian, though his credentials arguably got alias Billy the Kid, its publishers. Actually, he accepted old-timers' malarkey and misstated primary documents. He fabled rabble-rousing to reason. On alias Billy the Kid's cover, he taunted, Was he Billy the Kid? If not, who was he? Intended was, wow, 
Brushy must have been really convincing. The real answer was in 1950, Brushy was one of the planet's almost three billion people who weren't Billy the Kid. Charles Leland Sonnishim was born on September 20th, 1901 in Fonda, Iowa, moving with his family to Minnesota 15 years later. In 1924, he got a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. In 1931, he got his Harvard PhD. That year, he was hired to teach English at the El Paso, Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy, later the University of Texas at El Paso. Sonnishin's University of Texas archivist for his donated papers wrote, he was asked to teach a course in Southwest literature, which at the time he did not believe to exist, being a 17th and 18th century English literature man. He accepted, though, and began what became a lifelong study of Southwest literature and history. Sonnishin's biographer, Dale L. Walker, in his foreword to Sonnishin's reprinted 2000 book, 10 Texas Feuds, was more blunt. He wrote, he stayed at the College of Mines and Metallurgy because college teaching positions were scarce in the Great Depression era and because he was appreciated at the college where doctoral degrees were scarcer than jobs and Harvard doctorates unknown. He would later say, I was a big fish in a little pond. I call that the clue to why Sonnishin fell. With Brushy, he seized his chance to be a big fish in the big pond of Billy the Kid history. From 1933 to 1960, Sonnishin headed the college's English department, becoming graduate dean till 1966. He was on its library committee, publications committee, and editorial board of the Texas Western Press. He was also vice president and director of the El Paso Historical Society. Retiring from teaching in 1972, he became senior editor for the Journal of Arizona History until 1976. He was on editorial boards of Arizona and the West and the Journal of Arizona History. He was president of the Texas Folklore Society from 1935 to 1936, president of the Western Literature Association in 1966, president of the Western History Association in 1966, sheriff of the El Paso Ramuda of the Westerners in 1967, president of the Western Writers of America in 1977, and on the Executive Council of the Southwestern Literature Association. His club cronies apparently tolerated his slipshod research and hoaxing. His University of Texas archivist wrote, he authored 34 books, mostly on Southwestern history and folklore, and published short stories and articles in numerous Southwestern and Western periodicals. She omitted his alias, Billy the Kid. His biographer, Dale L. Walker, in his foreword to Sonnishin's 10 Texas Feuds, said Sonnishin called himself a grassroots historian who, quote, recognizes that the original researcher was an old plainsman lying in a buffalo wallow standing off a bunch of Comanches and two bust to write anything down. In fact, that made Sonnishin's Plainsman a participator, not an historical researcher, but Sonnishin liked to belittle real scholarship. Walker quoted him from 10 Texas Feuds as stating, it was so long ago and there is so little we can know about such things. So Sonnishin likely excused hoaxing as part of history's vagueness. 
He seemed incapable of distinguishing hearsay from evidence, and he responded to criticism by conspiracy theories accusing opponents. He was after notoriety, not truth. C. L. Sonnershin died at 89 on June 29, 1991. In 1992, his Arizona humoresque, A Century of Arizona Humor, was posthumously published. That was appropriate because he'd escaped unscathed after making a mockery of Billy the Kid, the most important Old West figure he'd hijacked. Sonnershin first met Brushy Bill in 1949, brought to him by his promoter, William V. Morrison. Historian Donald Klein, in his 1988 question mark unpublished book, Brushy Bill Roberts, I Wasn't Billy the Kid, stated that Morrison got Sonnishin's name from Arthur Graves, owner of Car Parts Depot, for whom Morrison worked as a salesman. Graves knew Sonnishin from a college course he'd taken. Sonnishin proved he had more hubris than history by thinking brushy past for the real deal. That first meeting is described by Dale L. Walker in his 1972 biography, C. L. Sonnishin, Grassroots Historian. Walker wrote, Roberts was decked out in a fringed buckskin jacket and a Stetson. After talking to him and Morrison, Sonnishin too became convinced. Walker quoted Flowery Sonnishin. Here was a Western Lazarus, risen from the dead with a six-shooter in each hand, who was willing to tell of his experiences behind the veil. Brushy Bill knew too much to have been an outsider. He was not a literate man and could not have read up on the subject. His recollections were too detailed and precise to have come from oral sources. He must have been there in the flesh when these things happened. Sonnershin also accepted Imposter Morrison as a lawyer, calling him a graduate non-practicing attorney in alias Billy the Kid. So, gullibility plus ignorance plus ambition tipped Sonnishin into the hoax. In Alias Billy the Kid, Sonnishin revealed Brushy's so-called precise recollection that it hooked him. About the Lincoln County War, Brushy had said that, quote, Negro soldiers from Fort Stanton took positions on the hillside and joined in the firing that day when the Murphy men burned McSween's house. In reality, Fort Stan Commander N.A.M. Dudley's black cavalry men were never on the South Hillside and didn't fire at all. Ignorant of sources, Sonnishin missed that Coach Brushy lifted the black cavalry men from Walter Noble Burns's 1926 book, the saga of Billy the Kid. Canny salesman Morrison courted Sonnishin for his credentials and ambition. Morrison's letter of August 17, 1950, tempted with cloak and dagger intrigue about their future Billy the Kid publicity coup. Morrison wrote, I prefer that you do not admit in writing that you talked with my friend Brushy I have never made the admission to Bill Latham, managing editor of the El Paso Times, that kid is still living. I told him I thought the old man had a just claim with merit. I will keep in touch with you. Morrison also seduced Sonnishin by advertising him as a Billy the Kid historian. This is seen in his May 7, 1954 letter to historian Philip J. Rash, into which he slipped Sonnishin and gave him a copy. It stated, People in the class of you, Robert Mullen, C.L. Sonnishin, and Maurice Garland Fulton desire to see the true facts 
and records prevail. Biographer Dale L. Walker himself duped by Sonishin in his 1997 book Legends and Lies, Great Mysteries of the American West, back Brushy in his chapter I'm Billy the Kid, the case of Brushy Bill Roberts. Walker plugged Sonishin as, quote, a brilliant Harvard-educated English professor and historian who knew about the Lincoln County War and counted among his friends some of the greatest authorities on it and on Billy the Kid. The result was a small but respectable collaborative effort, alias Billy the Kid, 1955, a fair and balanced work. He quoted Sonishin's quip about Brushy as Billy. If it were not true, it ought to be. Walker, himself historically ignorant and calling Sheriff William Brady James, hid that for the past 47 years, Sonishin's so-called greatest authorities' friends had called Brushy Bill an imposter and alias Billy the Kid a hoax. Sonishin backed the hoax publicly. In 1951, El Paso Sunland News Bureau reporter Hawley Richardson presented his interview. Dr. Sonishin said, In my opinion, the evidence Morrison turned up indicates that the whole case of the kid's death or survival needs to be re-examined. Dr. Sonishin, who has authored many books on Southwestern history and lore, said that he expects to commence work on the book on Brushy Bill sometime this summer. That Sonishin, solely authored alias Billy the Kid, was made clear by Morrison in a March 15, 1952 letter to a DeWitt Travers, a friend of Brushy, whom Morrison used for a fake affidavit that Brushy was Billy the Kid. Morrison wrote, Quite some time ago, I turned my records and notes over to Dr. Sonishin. I did not have the time and money to complete the book like I wanted it. Dr. Sonishin took the material and added some from his files. He has done a wonderful job. And on September 10th, 1954, Morrison wrote to Billy the Kid historian, Robert N. Mullen, few people realize the guts it took to stick this thing out, plus the hard work my associate Sonishin put in the manuscript. After Morrison died in 1977, Sonishin encouraged new brushy backers one was hoaxer William A. Tunstall, who faked a genealogy for Brushy and added names from Billy Bonney's history for his 1988 book, Billy the Kid and Me Were the Same. On April 24, 1987, 32 years after alias Billy the Kid's release, Tunstall wrote to Sonishin, citing their long association. He wrote, your letter of April 17th at hand, as well as a copy of your letter to Mr. Morrison's daughter. Thanks. I cannot beg her to write to me. You did the best you could with that data Mr. Morrison furnished you. This fact I have related to you several times the past six years. I think she would make a big mistake to merely reprint the old alias Billy the Kid. As I see it, I must deplete he meant delete, those items which are in error or incomplete and add the new items which offers proof that Brushy Bill Roberts was in fact the real Billy the Kid. To be noted is that Sonishin had already secretly resorted to such forgery to make a better Brushy for alias Billy the Kid. Sonishin also failed the Test of Time, from the 1955 publication of Alias Billy the Kid to his death in 1991, scholarly advances in Billy the Kid history made even more obvious Brushy's fakery. 
including his birth date of August 26, 1879, with real Billy's being 20 years earlier in 1859. But when interviewed for a book by brushy backing authors W.C. Jameson and Frederick Bean, Sonishin was unrepentant. According to their 1998 book, The Return of the Outlaw, Billy the Kid, he announced that he'd been vilified but had gotten, quote, never one shred of evidence to disprove Robert's claim. Sonishin's bluff was inadvertently called in a May 26, 1989 letter from a Robert Dyer, a member of the Western Writers of America, Southwest Writers Workshop, and the Billy the Kid Outlaw Gang. He wanted to clarify Sonishin's position. Dyer wrote, In the process of compiling my research, I read your book, Alias Billy the Kid, you appear to have supported the Brushy Bill claim at that time. I heard from a reliable source, however, that you recently told Leon Metz, Pat Garrett's biographer, that you wish you'd never written the damn thing. Did you indeed make the statement? I've been told that you discovered that you had been duped by Morrison into half believing the story and that Morrison invented the whole thing. I heard that he led this old, senile, but otherwise harmless old man, Brushy Bill, all over Billy the Kid territory, teaching him line and scripture about the kid's life, then managed either to convince him that he was the kid or convince him of the money that could be involved. Can you tell me if any of this is true? The real Sonishin responded furiously in a May 30th letter designed to frighten away Robert Dyer as guilty of character assassination while fence riding to cover himself. But he recommended that Dyer read hoaxer William A. Tunstall's book. Sonishin added, pretending neutrality, that he'd refuse to participate in the Lincoln County Heritage Trust's comparison of Billy the Kid's tintype to Brushy. In fact, it proved no match, which Sonishin ignored. Pulling big fish rank, Sonishin hissed, I don't know how much you know about what has been going on in New Mexico and Texas, but it is becoming a pretty complicated story, and you will need to get hold of Bill Tunstall's book, Billy the Kid and Me Were the Same, and several recent articles and magazines before you will be ready to talk. Note that he recommended no legitimate historian. I can answer some of your questions categorically. I never told Leon Metz that I was sorry I wrote the book. If you read it at all carefully, you will have noted that my last word was, if he wasn't Billy the Kid, who was he? I presented Morrison's evidence, but I did not take sides. In the second place, I can assure you that Morrison was a dedicated researcher and, in my view, an honest man. It seems to me that there is some character assassination going on here, and I want no part of it. What should be a search for the truth is degenerating into eye-gouging and name-calling. You can see why I want to keep my distance. Don't miss that Sonishin didn't answer Dyer's question, did you back the hoax? But his hoax-backing response was enough. Sonishin's obvious brushy-backing is seen in an April 27, 1990 letter to him from Frederick Bean, a novelist and dupe whose pro-brushy book Sonishin was encouraging. It became 1998's The Return of the Outlaw, Billy the Kid, with co-author country western singer W.C. Jameson. It's debunked in later talks. 
Bean wrote to Sonishin that he'd followed up on his advice to contact William Tunstall, the genealogy faker, and Donald Klein, a brushy opponent. He stated that he had a question. Klein told him that Morrison was a car parts salesman, not a lawyer. Was that true? Sonishin responded to him evasively on May 6th while manipulatively implying that backing Brushy required noble courage. He wrote, Bill Morrison never said he was a licensed attorney. He spoke of himself as a non-practicing lawyer. I gathered that he had studied law, perhaps in night school in St. Louis. What he did for a living was handling bankruptcy cases. Note that this implies as a lawyer, but Morrison was just a bankruptcy liquidator, meaning he sold or liquidated a bankrupt person's assets to pay their creditors. If he was a car parts salesman, I never knew it. Actually, my chief reason for wanting not to be involved in this brouhaha is the disposition on the part of some of the participants to be destructive. I hope you can get out of this without getting your fingers burned. I think you are in some danger. Close quote. This grandiosely fake danger was copied by later brushy hoaxers. On May 9th, gullible Frederick Bean responded to Sonishin that he'd decided that Morrison was in fact an attorney since Webster's Dictionary called an attorney, quote, a person who was legally empowered to act for another. Though being missed that legally empowered meant by a law degree and a license. Bean gushed. Morrison was, as you put it, a furious researcher. The credit for bringing Brushy Bill's story to light is entirely his. A new generation will be compelled by the story. This kind of adulating sucker was exactly what Sonishin had sought. He was their big fish. Bean's November 11, 1990 letter to Sonishin proved Sonishin's hoax backing. Sonishin was aiding publication of Bean's book, supporting Bean's attack on brushy opponent Donald Klein, and approving Bean's photo analysis to contradict the Lincoln County Heritage Trust 1989 one, proving no match of brushy to Billy. Note that Bean's photo analysis is debunked in a later talk about his book. Excerpted, Bean wrote, Thanks so very, very much for the copy of Arizona History. Read it the minute I got it and found the footnotes about Klein, all too accurate. As graduate in psychology, I'd call Klein a paranoid, delusional, openly psychotic type. Why Sunstone or Creative published him is one of the world's greatest mysteries. The tip you gave me about Tracy Rowe was a gem. He sounds very much like he wants to do my book. The data from the UT Austin photo study, this was Bean's fake photo comparison, interests him. I told him I was keeping you posted on the manuscript and photo study. Best and keep your fingers crossed, Fred. To be noted is that on November 9th, two days before Bean's letter, Sonishin had gotten an earth-shattering one from historian Donald Klein himself. Klein stated, finally located Brushy Bill and his family in Bates, Arkansas in the 1880 census confirming his actual birth year of 1879 and birthplace as Arkansas in the 1900 and 1910 census. Morrison, Hefner, another brushy backer, and Tun still claimed he has a cousin named Ali L and whose parents, 
Henry O. and Sarah Elizabeth Ferguson were Ollie's parents and were Brushy's aunt and uncle, and he took Ollie's place in the late 1880s or later as their son. Note that this was Tunstall's genealogy, faking Brushy as having a fictitious cousin, Ollie L. Roberts, yet here he is as Oliver Roberts, born in 1879, living with his so-called by Tunstall aunt and uncle H.O. and Sarah Ferguson as his parents in 1880 when he was 10 months old. Note that Henry Oliver H.O. Roberts and Sarah Elizabeth Ferguson were indeed Brushy's real parents. So two days later, dishonest Sonishin hid from his dupe, Frederick Bean, that Donald Klein had cracked the brushy hoax by proving his fatal birth date, making him under two at Billy Bonney's death. And if Sonishin had doubts, as a supposed open-minded historian, he could have checked the census reports himself. W.C. Jameson, Frederick Bean's dupe co-author for 1998's The Return of the Outlaw Billy the Kid, had been in contact with Sonishin from 1962 when he was in his English class to the man's 1991 death. Jameson recounted in his own 2012 brushy backing book, Billy the Kid, The Lost Interviews, that Sonishin told him that he'd warned Morrison to be prepared for historians trying to perpetuate what Sonishin called the status quo of the legend. That's what competitive conspiracy theory mongering Sonishin called legitimate history. Sonishin encouraged Jameson to do further work on the man Sonishin called William Henry Roberts the hoax's made-up name to mimic real Billy's William Henry Bonney. But there was more. According to W.C. Jamison's book, Sonishin wrote alias Billy the Kid using Morrison's notes and his taped interviews with Brushy, and without disclosure, he altered them. As Jamison wrote, it became clear that Sonishin used a relatively small amount of the information, and he heavily edited Robert's grammar, even adding and deleting words. In other places, Sonishin merely summarized. Guileless Jameson thus revealed Sonishin's secret fixing up of Brushy to better match Billy Bonney. To Billy the Kid historians, it seemed inconceivable that C.L. Sonishin would stoop so low. So on February 24, 1952, Maurice Garland Fulton, aware of Brushy Bill's 1950 pardon fiasco, wrote from Roswell, New Mexico, in response to the rumor that Sonishin was writing a Brushy Bill book. Fulton assumed it was an expose. He wrote, I'm glad to hear from you directly about your book. I'll admit I had fears that you might injure your reputation as a grassroots historian. I would remind you that the masses are highly unintelligent and undiscriminating. They will follow the line of least resistance, which would be to say, well, maybe it might be. I feel that Morrison got much information from his visits to Lincoln I must have coached the old fellow. I did not meet Morrison until his third trip to Lincoln when he caught me unawares and talked one Sunday afternoon for about three hours. I felt that he did not get from Brushy Bill anything that an old timer who had steeped himself in Billy the Kid lore and books could get. Morrison at that time had a cock and bull story of Brushy having gone to London and of singing before royalty with John Tunstall drawn in. When it comes to the question of the escape from Garrett shooting, I see no grounds for the idea that Brushy escaped killing through a plot. You have to postulate a considerable conspiracy to which honest men like John W. Poe became party. 
As to the reward for killing Billy the Kid, the legislature met the following January and in February passed legislation that gave Garrett his $500. The reward offer by Lou Wallace had specified satisfactory proof of identity required, and the legislature officially accepted it on that ground. Nor have I found any indication to disbelief in the fact that it was the kid. I'm not trying to dictate, but I hope you will make as clear what your position is. The question most frequently asked me was, what does Morrison intend to make out of this effort? You know that there is an eradicable element in human beings toward fakery and frauds and impostures. All these devices may be attributed to cupidity in the larger sense. Maybe I should say the desire to get something for nothing. The impersonator is, of course, a sort of forgery. If your presentation of Brushy Bill would guide people to some thinking about the psychology behind such performances, it might serve the world well. Sonishin was forewarned, but Fulton didn't imagine that Sonishin was betting on tricking those highly unintelligent and undiscriminating masses, and the only psychology in question was Sonishin's own. C.L. Sonishin's hoaxing will be extensively exposed in following talks debunking alias Billy the Kid, but examples are given here to give a feel for his chicanery. Foremost is that, by his book's 1955 publication date, Sonishin knew that the coroner's jury report existed, proving Pat Garrett's victim was Billy Bonney, that William B. Morrison was a salesman posing as a lawyer, and that Brushy had been exposed as an imposter by his fatal errors in his Billy the Kid pardon hearing. For the book's back cover, Sonishin advertised himself with his Harvard Ph.D. and posed as a Billy the Kid historian, quote, highly regarded by readers and scholars alike as a contributor to Southwestern law and letters. Likewise, he exaggerated Morrison as, quote, an investigator for a legal firm and a graduate lawyer with a good nose for evidence. In the book, Sonish and Fake Proof of Brushy's Special Knowledge by adding footnoted sources to Brushy's statements as if corroborating them, but they were actually Brushy's prompt sources as proved by his parroting their telltale errors. Sonishin also faked Brushy's inability to study up by calling him illiterate while owning copies of his literate cursive and printed handwriting and even accidentally citing in alias Billy the Kid the notebooks Brushy wrote to store his Old West information. Sonishin also used hearsay as evidence. A dramatic example shows how he created Brushy's Fort Sumner death scene. For it, Sonishin had used his own shoddy Billy the Kid research from five years before he met Brushy. Note that it implies Sonishin's failed attempt to join early Billy the Kid scholars. Morrison then used it to prompt Brushy. On April 15, 1944, Sonishin had interviewed Jack Fountain, a son of Billy's April of 1881 Messiah lawyer, Albert Jennings Fountain. Revealed is Sonishin's inability to vet his sources. It's obvious that neither Albert Jennings nor Jack had personal evidence about Billy's Fort Sumner killing, with Messiah being 213 miles away. And Jack, born August 31, 1875, was then under six. But Sonishin recorded as fact 
68-year-old Jack's old-timer malarkey, inserting himself into the history by claiming Pat Garrett told it to him. Any competent researcher would have asked Jack why it completely differed from Garrett's actual telling in his 1882 book, The Authentic Life of Billy the Kid. Sonishin didn't. And he used the information as an alias Billy the Kid footnote corroborating Brushy's tale. Jack had made up that Garrett told him that the side of beef at the Maxwell house hung beside Peter Maxwell's bedroom. So he shot Billy from inside the bedroom but hit him outside at the beef. In reality, the beef hung at the mansion's north porch, the side opposite to the bedroom. Inept Sonishin then compounded Jack's fiction by making up that Peter's bedroom was at the house's back when it was actually at the front southeast corner. When fed this junk, Coach Brushy, wildly confabulating around the back of house location, came up with a death scene of his imaginary friend, Billy Barlow, mistaken for him as Billy the Kid, being shot on the Maxwell House's back porch. He threw in himself as wounded in the backyard in a hail of bullets by unnamed assailants. Not to be missed, however, is that Jack's tall tale, nevertheless, had real Billy as the victim, so dishonest Sonishin hid that. Sonishin also hoaxed in alias Billy the Kid by lying about content of obscure documents, betting no reader would check them. Thus, to fake no existing coroner's jury report, he lied that Acting Governor William Richards' July 21st, 1881, executive record book entry, which he had, denied Pat Garrett the reward for lack of the report proving victim identity. In fact, Rich, who had a copy of the report sent him by Garrett, wrote in his entry that he had merely delayed payment till a legislative act, which Sonishin also had, converted Governor Lou Wallace's private reward to a territorial one. But Sonishin made up that the legislature granted the reward without the report because of corrupt Santa Fe ring control. Sonishin also preferred jeering to evidence. In alias Billy the Kid, after his fakery about the coroner's jury report, he proclaimed, What can be found in black and white about the shooting in Pete Maxwell's house leads to a most peculiar fact. He wrote in capitals, there is no actual proof of the death of Billy the Kid. So he labeled the book's appendixes translated report as report of the coroner's jury translation of a photostat copy of a purported original which was never filed in San Miguel County. Sonishin also created conspiracy theories countering hoax opposition. He claimed that people lied about Billy being killed because no one expected Brushy to return as Billy and expose them. He also wrote that Brushy had been deprived of, quote, his day in court in order that his representatives could produce whatever was down in black and white for or against him, while hiding that Brushy's impersonation failed in his Governor Maybury hearing. Sonishin also admitted that the survival claim required a, quote, hard-to-swallow cover-up conspiracy by Pat Garrett, John W. Poe, and all Fort Sumner residents from July 14, 1881 to the present. Then he backed it, making up that everyone protected Brushy as Billy. For proof of survival, Sonishin used post-death date sightings of Billy by non-historical people 
and Morrison's fake affidavits by non-historical people swearing Brushy was Billy. Though, alias Billy the Kid, was trounced by historians, Sonnishin was unfazed. He had sought attention, and he got it. So he partnered for a rerun with Morrison for a winter 1959 to 1960 Frontier Times article titled, They Killed Pancho Villa. Morrison had likely used its information to coach Brushy for his fictitious association with Villa, but their Pancho Villa book was rejected by their University of New Mexico publisher and never printed. By 1986, Sonnishin still held to his scam. As Donald Klein wrote, to the New Mexico Book League on August 4th, 1986, a copy of which was in Sonnishin's papers. Sonnishin and Morrison both knew Brushy Bill Roberts was not Billy the Kid, but simply one of the many old men seeking a little attention. I also did the background research on Roberts and was amazed to find that what was stated in the book is not backed up by the records and sources they claimed. But then, all the historians already knew this, they were simply after the buck and not writing true history. Interestingly, Sonnishin, pretending his usual neutrality in a letter of May 29, 1991, to a Stephanie Ricks of the Book of the Month Club, reported that he transferred all rights to alias Billy the Kid to Morrison before Morrison's 1977 death, implied is not Sonnishin's innocence, but that his motive for hoaxing had been fame, not fortune. It was fitting that Charles Leland Sonnishin's last public appearance, according to his biographer Dale L. Walker's foreword in Sonnishin's reprinted 2000 book, 10 Texas Feuds, was in a June of 1991 Western Writers of America Convention in Oklahoma City. Sonnishin's topic was the future of Western fiction. In fact, he was a major contributor with his brushy Bill imposter hoax in Alias Billy the Kid. And unlike mitigating pity, one might feel for a mentally handicapped brushy Bill and sociopathically abnormal William V. Morrison, C.L. Sonnishin was merely a self-aggrandizing incompetent, aping an historian. And he succeeded. His book continues to spawn brushy dupes and brushy hoaxers. To them, he is the big fish of his desire. In reality, C.L. Sonnishin never rose above a bottom feeder. The talks to follow will expose in detail the Billy the Kid imposter hoax by Brushy Bill Roberts, William V. Morrison, and C.L. Sonnishin. <laughs>